Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and my fellow video essayist, Tom Vanderlinden from the channel Like Stories of Old, that seeks to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. This week we're talking about Sidney Lumet's classic 12 Angry Men. This is an old favorite of mine. I watched it a bunch of times back when I got into kind of cinema one of the early like classic films that I really connected with and I'm pretty familiar with the story. I think I first saw it as a play even before I saw the movie. So I was pretty excited to revisit this and and talk about it. Tom, I think this was your second time watching it, right? I seen it once like you did probably as someone who just got into movies. This one, I think it's top five of the best films of all time on IMDb in the, the top 250 movies. So I think this is one of the movies that a lot of newcomers to cinema, they find relatively early. And I think it's it's a good one to start with because I, for an older movie, like I, that's the response I see a lot with this movie. Like they say, uh, oh, I don't usually care for black and white or anything prior to 1990 but this one was pretty good and yeah it's clear to see why it's it's a compelling story it's a well-paced story it feels relevant today it's just an interesting study as well in terms of mechanics the way the camera operates and the way lenses are used to create tension and atmosphere and there's a lot to unpack there which to me makes it a yeah a fascinating movie i've Though I've have, I didn't revisit it a lot, not as much as you did. I, uh, as I said, I watched it once in that early phase, and then uh, never really got back into it until last night. I was surprised at how well I still remembered it, which is maybe why yeah. I didn't go back to it as often because it, it's it's a one that always felt like it's it's stuck in my mind and it remained kind of fresh there. And so yeah, I look I look forward to uh, diving into it. Yeah. The pitch maybe for people who, if you're listening to this, you haven't seen it yet. 12 Angry Men is about 12 jurors, 12 men who are a a jury. And the the movie kind of picks up right as the trial is ending. And then it plays out pretty much in real time in uh, the jury room as there's like 11 guys who are convinced that the defendant is guilty. And one guy Mm -hmm. who is kind of like we should talk about this at least he he doesn't start out convinced that he's not guilty he's just like we should discuss it and then it unfolds from there and so it's like very simple premise mm-hmm. and basically like a bottle episode you know single location film pretty much all happens within this one room and so like tom was saying it's a great case study for like how to keep that interesting how to use like the position of the camera to kind of like portray the conflict and the dynamics between all the different guys. There's great performances. I was thinking about watching it this time, how like whenever I've tried to write something, a screenplay or something Mm -hmm. like, and I've heard this from other people too, like one of the most difficult things is giving like each character a unique voice and like characterization and making them like sound like a distinct entity. And that can be hard for, you know, a beginner screenwriter, even when you're just writing like three or four characters. But it strikes me just like how well fleshed out like each of these guys is and how like immediately you can kind of like figure out what is going Mm -hmm. on with each guy. And you're like, oh, you know, they each have a distinct like upbringing or background or like position. It's very well written. It's a great showcase of how like good performance, good camera work, good writing can keep even just like one location and a conversation very interesting. And then beyond that, it also delves into these, like an exploration of the of at least the American justice system and like juries and how they work and how courtrooms work and, you know, how evidence and witness testimony operate and prejudice and all of these things. And even though it was made in 1957, it still feels pretty fresh. I love how it unfolds. It had been a while since I since I saw it and a lot of the quote unquote plot points were like still very fresh in my mind where it's like, you know, I know they're going to talk about the knife. I know they're going to, you know, pace out the room. They're going to go through all these different beats. I remembered a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. But even knowing exactly how it's going to unfold, I was still kind of riveted by the tension of the whole thing. And I think The beauty of that is because there's so much happening like underneath the just the discussion of the case, like there's conflict between the two guys and you're kind of hanging on the 
the words of the different jurors waiting for that moment where like you want to catch on their face like when they might change their mind yeah all those dynamics are in play and so mm -hmm. i find that very like engaging to watch and it it kind of really sucked me into it yeah yeah it reminded me a lot of our discussion on the man from earth in the sense that that it's basically a story that presents you with this singular concept and then spends the entire movie just breaking it down and exploring yes. every little detail of it, which is something that I really enjoy. And it's now more obvious than ever the way the man from Earth took inspiration from this movie or basically any single setting story yeah. has a lot that it's, uh, that it's taken from this movie. But that being said, I think this is also a good film or a good example to show how much more 12 Angry Men did than the man from Earth in sense of the man from Earth had a, not to spend too much time on that movie, but yeah. there was a, an interesting concept there as we talked about, but there wasn't much in terms of interrelations between the characters. There wasn't much in terms of the location and how it was used and the way the camera was used. And so what you see with this movie, why I guess it's still one of the, the greats, is because you do have all those layers that are worth looking at, worth studying, and that all reveals something that adds to the just to the intensity of the story, which I thought was just really, really well done, especially on, um, or even on rewatch. But the interesting for me at revisiting it now was that it, not just seeing the things that are still very relevant, but also maybe looking at some of the stuff that doesn't feel as relevant anymore. Yeah. It's almost become a bit of an idealistic image in the way that you have these different men coming together in a room and arguing with each other till they find some common ground in the, it feels like a, some part of that isn't really possible this day anymore in right, yeah, yeah. the age of the internet where every single one of those individuals would likely find their own little community somewhere and become even further entrenched so in that sense this movie has made me feel a bit more pessimistic about when it comes to our possibility to find a consensus like that or even have like a genuine meaningful conversation like that and you can tell the way they that there's a lot going on in, in the sense of how human beings interact with each other how we argue with each other and how we should deal with different and opposing views or opposing yeah. viewpoints and also when not to <laughs> still one of the funniest things that stuck out to me this time is there's that scene where the one they don't, they don't have names and they only have numbers but there's the one really explicitly racist juror who goes on this rant at some point that makes every other character reject him and they all turn their backs to him they all step away from yeah. the table and they're like you go sit over there and shut up right. now because this is <laughs> even yeah. the one he's not even the most ardent leader of the case or the defendant being guilty that's i'm not sure what his number was exactly but there's the one who's breaks last that's something i thought was interesting that it's yeah. not the most obviously racist one that is the last one to break but that's the one who's pretty much evicted from the conversation entirely and i also really liked how it doesn't start with a more sentimental notion like oh the this yeah. is indeed a troubled young kid who is on the who is the defendant and we should pity him and he should deserve better or whatever but that's it's really more about there might be reasonable doubt that the door is right. really at this tiniest crack like we're not we're not redeeming this character or this person we're not saying he's not a bad person we're not saying he shouldn't be punished or we're not even saying he's not guilty but it's just that there isn't enough for him to be definitively guilty i guess that's yeah. something i'm not american i don't have that kind of judicial system like for me this is all new stuff so i'm not i wasn't sure to what extent all of it was correct like for me the idea that the punishment was already known before the judgment i'm not sure if that's something that ordinarily happens because I'm, i can guess that really sways the jury in yeah. one direction if they know like oh if we're gonna vote guilty he's gonna get a prison sentence or of two years or he's gonna get the death sentence you know those are right. might influence how a jury or at least i can imagine that might influence how a jury behaves yeah in my understanding now is that generally sentencing like happens after conviction so you know you wouldn't know for sure going in these days although it, it varies from state to state generally like different states have different you know mm -hmm. ways of they handle prosecution uh it might have been different at the time that this was 
filmed when like the death penalty was more common. But I do know it is a factor sometimes in cases where like if you're in a death penalty state for the jury, even just knowing that that's a possibility that could happen, like sometimes that will mm -hmm. that will affect things. It may have been the case you know, in the fifties yeah. that like they would have known going in that if, you know, he was guilty, he would definitely be executed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure on the accuracy of that. I don't think that's how it is most of the time anymore. I really like what you pointed out there. I, I was thinking about that a lot where there's so many ways you could write this story in just like the really overbearing way that is just like mm -hmm. super preachy or doesn't feel authentic or like, yep. I don't know. It just, it doesn't feel like it's straw manning too much. Like, right. There are some parts where it gets a little melodramatic, but it's, yeah, yeah, it doesn't feel like the lefty guy's perception of the right winger or some or the right. reverse. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the reasons why it does that so well is what you pointed out, where it's like Henry Fonda, kind of the lead, who is like the juror who starts out with the opposing position. If you were watching this movie and it was written today, like it would probably start with like one person being like, he's not guilty. And then like trying to immediately convince everybody else. Mm -hmm. The like point that Fonda's character is standing on is like, like, no, I think we should just like at least talk about this. He's like, basically his initial position is just like, we need to respect human life enough to just like do our due diligence here. Mm -hmm. And you can almost watch like, him become more convinced as like they talk through it. I love that dynamic and it, it gives almost his character an arc as well instead of just like he starts on this like moral high ground and then, you know, is just like the hero of the whole story. It's kind of that way a little bit, but like mm -hmm. it softens it a little. I love the moment where there's Henry Fonda like about midway through or something goes into the bathroom and the other guy's there, the guy who wants to go to the baseball game the entire time. Mm. He asks him if he's a salesman and if he knows what a soft sell is and tells him that like he has a soft sell because that's a perfect description of like what Henry Fonda does here. I think inadvertently, he's not really trying to convince everybody, but he lures mm -hmm. a bunch of people in to his side, essentially, by like not trying yeah. to convince them. I like how they handle his character a lot. This episode of Cinema of Meaning is sponsored by Nebula Classes. Right now, you can check out our fellow video essayist, Patrick H. Willem's new class, How to Make a Movie. I love how practical this class is. It focuses on how to get a film made with limited resources, and it has some great advice that I think is really helpful, but that I haven't seen in other classes on filmmaking. Patrick is drawing from his recent experience making his first feature film, so a lot of these details are fresh in his mind. Nebula Classes is a brand new part of Nebula. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service where you can find all of Tom and I's content along with this podcast podcast, ad-free and early, as well as bonus exclusive content from both of us and a ton of other great creators out there. With the new Nebula classes upgrade to the Nebula subscription, you can now watch a bunch of classes from your favorite Nebula creators. You can check out how to make a movie and the other great classes from Nebula creators when you sign up for Nebula classes, which is $149 a year or $119 if you use our link. You get all the usual Nebula content with that subscription. And if you already have Nebula through Curiosity Stream, you can upgrade for just $99. Go to nebulaclasses.com slash cinema of meaning or click the link in the description to get $30 off. Or if you're already a Nebula subscriber, upgrade today and check out how to make movies from Patrick H. Willems. That's nebulaclasses.com slash cinema of meaning. Yeah, what do you think about the one that breaks last than the one that the most heavy-handed proposer, I guess, for yeah. the guilty verdict. He obviously had the stuff going on with his own son, which I guess he yes. was projecting. But that's a recurring right. theme, I guess, in all of the characters that everyone brings some of their own prejudice to a discussion like this, which as, as a non-American had me questioning the entire value of this kind of jury system, <laughs> system where all these random <laughs> citizens can come in and decide over the fate of someone who stands trial and then it seems like it's so much of the verdict then depends on the kind of people you bring into a jury i recently saw the there's a movie yeah. coming out on emma till which is the famous story or infamous i guess the story of the murder of this young african-american child whose killers weren't prosecuted most likely because the jury was all white there was no one to voice uh, no voice from the community that he came from and 
I guess this movie, 12 Angry Men, you do have the one character who also grew up in the slums as the defendant is, as they keep repeating. Yeah. Which immediately shows how meaningful it is to have a jury that has some sort of diversity in it, where people come from. I'm not sure to what extent that is. Maybe nowadays better organized or that they make sure that there's all kinds of voices or all kinds of just different people in there who might contribute or might perceive something differently because that's, of course, a lot of the point. That's what you also see with the old man jury member who so much is about what they notice and what they don't notice during the presentation of evidence, the witness testimonies. There's a lot of it that is just focusing on different details and everyone has their own little lens through which they perceive or completely miss out on those. Yeah, it's a great commentary on kind of like the way this type of justice system operates. And I think Mm -hmm. it is, it does make a great case for the necessity for like representation and diversity on a jury. I think like in a lot of ways, the idea Mm -hmm. is that hopefully 12 members is enough that you get a mix in there and then you kind of on average achieve some kind of fairness, obviously that that can be flawed as this is pointing out. It's funny, like talking about these things is interesting because in a lot of ways, Like I saw this first as a play when I was a teenager and then like I would have seen the movie also like shortly after that. It's almost Mm -hmm. difficult to like completely untangle my opinions and understanding of like the American, the jury system from like this movie, because in a lot of ways, this may have been even the first like depiction I had ever seen of like a jury in operation. There's a sense in which this movie kind of, you know, probably influenced my perception of a lot of that going forward. Those issues still come mm-hmm. into into effect today. There's there's a yeah. lot of situations where there's a very complex jury selection problem or process that both the prosecution and the defendants get to take part in, but like, you know, sometimes trials are happen in specific places because they work out putting a trial in a different place because then it'll be a different group Mm -hmm. of people who are on the jury in that place more in favor of one side or the other. So yeah, it's definitely a tricky part of like, you know, how this stuff happens. Yeah. In that sense, the movie is missing some context, I'm guessing, in terms of how, what goes on before the jury steps into yes. that room for the, its little discussion, As for especially for someone who ha- who's not familiar with this kind of judicial system, like someone like me. There's already yeah. some prejudice that has happened before you even get to maybe right. the, the discussion that we see in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, some of it too is like, obviously I can't, without doing a bunch of research, I don't mm. know exactly you know, how this film fits into the position of its time. But I think like, you know, for 1957, I think this movie is a fairly progressive like critique, Mm -hmm. like in would in the mainstream, like, so it would have been potentially pushing the boundaries of what would have been like, oh, these things are important. There There would be a lot of people outside of the kind of demographic of white men that are in this jury in this movie who would have understood the unfairness of it but i think like within that demographic it wouldn't have been like a given that like oh we should you know mm-hmm. we need to expand this so that it is more fair and democratic or representative but yeah i think the movie does a great job of showcasing that in a really like by letting you watch it happen and i think that's one of the things that makes this movie interesting despite the fact that it's just a bunch of people talking in a room is that it, it still manages to showcase like show don't tell which we sometimes think of as like just being a fun function of like, oh, show don't tell means you have to see something in action versus in dialogue. You can actually show stuff happening in dialogue as well as Mm -hmm. telling and like you can both show and tell with dialogue. This movie really does a great job of showing with dialogue where like instead of telling us like, you know, oh, it's my perspective, like each jury's perspective matters. We just see a bunch of little examples of how like the old guy, you know, he has insight about the the old witness. The guy from the slums has insight about, you know, the switchblade that the other jurors mm-hmm. don't have. And there's the prejudice, both like the prejudice of each juror affects them, but also the experiences. The guy with the glasses is kind of like the final turning point. And so like it's pretty explicit by the end of it because all of these mm-hmm. things has accumulated it but it's not like they're coming out and talking about like oh you know 
uh, my perspective is what makes me able to mm -hmm. see it. You just see all these little examples of that stacking up throughout the film. And it kind of makes this case for that in a fairly organic way. Some of the moments are just a tiny bit on the nose, but <laughs> yeah. I think that uh, especially the racist guy at the yeah. beginning, he's more subtle in saying like, "Oh, they're they're all like that," or yeah. some of the some of them just can't help it; they're born that way. And at the beginning, it's still like in between the lines, almost as a did I hear that correctly? I'm I'm gonna, just gonna let it slide. Yeah, but then obviously he stands up and goes on the full rant, rant. and it's yeah, there's, there's no going around it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the movie makes a case for? the general value of this kind of judicial system, the way just the idea of bringing together citizens, especially like a diverse group of citizens to discuss the fate of yeah. someone who is put on trial. I was thinking about that and I'm not, I'm not really sure because, you know, in a sense it's showing the potential fallibility of this system pretty mm -hmm. blatantly where it's like, you know, people just want to get home and it's hot and they, you know, want to go to the ball game and they're distracted and mm -hmm. they are already convinced and, you know, uncritical of the system itself. And so, like, if Henry Fonda's character hadn't been there, this guy would have gone, you know, straight to to the chair or whatever. It's critical of the system in that way. But then the movie as a whole is also depicting this very like idealistic portrait of like, mm -hmm. but then it did work. Like they did talk it out and they figured it out and came out the other side with kind of like landing in the right position. And so there's a little bit of a push and pull there. Yeah. At, at first I thought like, as you said, there's the obvious critiques of not so much the system itself, but more so the way a person should behave within it like they yes keep emphasizing or oh, we have these principles and these principles are sound as long as you respect them so there's the idea of the due diligence as you said just having the conversation just discussing it going over it before making a final decision just out of respect for the human life that's potentially at stake there that's an obvious message at least to yeah. me there's the idea that you shouldn't bring your own prejudices in it and reflect on your own biases before you make certain judgments but that to me were the more obvious elements of the system is good as long as you behave well within it but to me the one thing that i felt was a bit weird on rewatching it this time was the way they kind of start doing their own speculations and their own research in addition to what was already, I'm guessing, the actual trial that right. went on beforehand. So you kind of see if there was a, they kind of mentioned that there was a failure on the lawyer's part to really hammer down on the witnesses and to really explore the case in detail, which they also explain by having court appointed lawyers who might not yeah. be into it that much and they kind of phone it in and leave a jury also with um, lack of evidence or maybe too many questions, too many open gaps. On the one hand, I think the movie is trying to say like, okay, there needs to be, for a jury to function properly, everything else has to function properly as well. Like a, a good right. jury cannot do its work if the work beforehand by the lawyers and the witnesses and everyone else involved hadn't also been done. But when that's not the case, it feels like the movie is looking for it's not exactly trying to argue that the jury can make up for the lack of investigation by doing it themselves, because some parts I thought were really interesting, the way the two witness statements contradicted each other by one claiming he heard a noise or he heard someone yelling, while the other witness claimed that at the exact same moment the train was going by, which I'd forgotten about that argument, so it was really interesting to have those dots connected again and yeah. feeling stupid all over again for not <laughs> thinking of that myself. <laughs> but that makes sense. That's logical arguments, I'm guessing. But then when they when there's the, sh the switchblade demonstration, right. like that to me, that felt where the jury kind of overstepped into speculation. Like, I get that it makes sense that you would hold it like the way the... Uh, the slum juror just to for lack of a better term point it out but you know if, if you take that scene one minute further you can also imagine maybe some scenario in which he dropped the blade or picked it right. up again or for some reason flipped it over in his hand especially if he was like really experienced with switchblades he could do like a quick tussle or something i'm not sure how, like a knife trick yeah. to 
have it in the other hand, which would fit the, the scenario as it was described. I felt like there were some elements where they were kind of moving into speculative territory, which I'm guessing is not exactly the appropriate job for a jury to do at that point, because that's what one of them, I think, also argued. I don't remember which one exactly, but that they, they should stick with the evidence that was presented and they should stick with the testimonies that they have and they, they can't basically restart the investigation all over again just because they feel like the lawyers didn't live up to their responsibilities or they didn't do their job properly. So um, I'm, th that's something I just felt a bit strange about. Like, is that something that can happen in actuality or something that should happen? Is Yeah, I, I don't know. That's uh, just a thought yeah. I had on the general role and the place of the whole judicial system in this right particular story there's i mean there's definitely an element and i, I mean i might get out of my depth in terms of my knowledge of the american <laughs> judicial system here so uh, apologies if i get anything wrong but like my understanding of the jury system is that there's almost an anarchic element to it in that sense where like you know you could have a discussion about what should take place or why the jurors should or shouldn't reason in a certain way. And like, you know, in the same way that the individuals have like a principle of like, oh, we should discuss this or mm -hmm. we shouldn't, you know, speculate in a certain way. Ultimately, there's like a certain amount of secrecy to like how the jury is conducted and that is like kind of respected and ultimately like jurors can make up their mind for you know whatever reason and people can talk about what should mm -hmm. or shouldn't be the case but like there is kind of this sanctity of like what these 12 people decide is what goes and then you can you can appeal if you don't like it you can you know the system has other checks for that but like you could theoretically have a jury of 12 people and all of them could be like, well, we do think he's guilty, but we're going to say not guilty. Like, we think mm -hmm. he did it, but we also think, like, the punishment would be unjust for this crime. And so we're going to say not guilty. Like, I would argue against doing that kind of, like, on the basis of principle, or some people would. But, like, that's technically, theoretically within the power of a jury to decide if they so chose. Mm -hmm. Which I think, in a sense, like, is a part of the ideal of it, of, like ultimately like within the american justice system your fate isn't within the hands of the state it's within the hands of other other people which is this like kind of the ideal here that's being represented is like this poor mm -hmm. guy if he is innocent is about to be prosecuted and convicted for this wrong thing but then one sympathetic man is able to like sway everybody and kind of like save the day and that's sort of one guy can be a check against the whole, like the state against him, witnesses, mm. you know, 11 other jurors. And that's kind of the ideal of it. Because for dramatic purposes too, like the argument happens and they eventually sway everybody to a decision by the end of this. But like probably, but in reality, like the entire 11 other guys could have been like, no, we think he's guilty. And Henry Fonda could have just been like, I have a reasonable doubt. And you could have argued for like, 11 days and nobody changed their vote and then you just end with a hung jury and that has to go back to trial hmm. and so that ideal does kind of exist within this conception of yeah. like how a jury operates like a yeah like like a built-in conscience system yeah i think this in a lot of ways you know there's there's elements of that that i think you're right that are strange especially if you're not used to it i think i'm so used to the this idea of like oh this is this is how it yeah. works Oh, I, I definitely get the idealistic elements of it. And I do like the idea of having the final say be with the citizens and not with the governing state. That That is something that I find really interesting. But especially in the Netherlands, there is a kind of, we actually, slightly different issue, but we did away with a direct referendum, which is where people sometimes get to vote directly on some government issue that may or not right. go into a single direction. We never had, I think, a... I'm not sure how to translate all the Dutch legal terms into <laughs> English, but there's two kinds of ref referenda is the right word, right? For for like passing a law? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically there's one that's decisive and one that's just advisory. So we used to only have an advisory, so people could vote on some issue, but the government didn't technically have to 
do anything with it. And there's a lot of, especially on the right, especially the more far right, even there's a lot of demand for a decisive one, one that if the population votes for something, then the government can't right. ignore it. And that's, I think, what happened in the UK with the Brexit. That was decided through a referendum yeah. like that one. But the reason we're hesitant about it and even did away with the advisory one, because it was just wildly expensive to organize. And then, yeah, you know, when you don't have to take the right. advice, yeah. you know, <laughs> what's the point? So it, it became more of this tool for like more populist parties yeah. to make a statement or to sway public opinion. And I guess that's also why we are reluctant to engage with more citizen-driven decision-making because it, it's so vulnerable for emotional and more populist influence. Yeah, And that's not to say that we don't want any kind of democracy. Like yeah, It's yeah. easy to say it's anti-democratic, but at the same time, it's there's a lot of options at the like before decision making, like there's a lot of initiatives for citizen participation before you even get to a yes or no decision on a certain policy. And I think that's what more progressive parties are leaning to. They want yeah. more from the more of that bottom up kind of involvement instead of at just only at the back end where there's suddenly a yes or no decision on a very complex issue that then gets hijacked by certain interest right. groups through. Uh, especially nowadays, it's so easy through social media to spread false information or that kind of stuff. But to bring it back to the American judicial system and the concept of citizen jurors, is that there is an element of that, I, I can imagine, in which one very charismatic person might overpower the other ones. And that's sort of... Although now I wouldn't say Henry Fonda in this case overpowered the others through just charisma and a kind of populist way of being he's just he I actually really like and the way he demonstrated to how you can be calm and rational and just use reasonable questions and arguments to break down the other one's arguments instead of imposing your own but still I can imagine because without him as you said earlier like this would have been a done deal and so you can imagine like how many verdicts there have been made where there wasn't a Henry Fonda character present, yeah. and that was only the one with the who had the issues with his son, who wanted this guy to fry, and, yeah. was, <laughs> and wanted to do it himself, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could easily have made a version of this movie where the opposite happens, like the evil mm -hmm. twin of Henry Fonda comes in, and it's like twelve <laughs> happy men or something, and like he talks him into like sending <laughs> yeah. a, an innocent person to jail or something. So, like, I think there's a sense in which, like. You know, this is more of a pro like jury film than an anti jury film. Yeah, I don't think that's that's I don't think we need to put it in those yes. limited uh in that kind of binary yeah, yeah. category. But yeah, that's... I agree. I think ultimately it's more about something you mentioned earlier, which is like the way you should personally behave in this kind of situation than it is trying to like deconstruct this entire system in and of itself. I mean, it's definitely pointing yeah. out flaws in like the justice system with some of the like, oh, it's a, it could be a public defender. You know, mm -hmm. it's talking more to like, how do we respond to those things? How do we think about those things? How should a jury behave yeah. than it is trying to like, you know, critique the idea of like a jury itself mm -hmm. or like how this kind of justice is depicted. It's interesting, like growing up in America and you take the way our system is constructed for granted. And then as you learn mm -hmm. more about other countries, like I've become increasingly aware the older I get of how like almost every detail of the American system is constructed around intense paranoia of like state tyranny, mm. which makes a lot of sense because that's what it was constructed to escape but like that goes all the way down to like issues like this where it's like yep it's in the hands of the people ultimately mm -hmm. which is you know an amazing ideal but also like you're pointing out can sometimes backfire you know and you can have yep. more populist movements that kind of take control of the people this kind of touches on we did a guest host recently we were guests on beyond the screenplay and we talked about gladiator and that movie mm -hmm. is very much about there's kind of this dynamic in that movie where they talk about the essence of Rome being kind of the people and the mob. And then the power then is located in like these individuals ability to sway the mob and sway the people. And so there's this weird interplay between like democracy, you know, republicanism in the, the Roman sense 
and like mm, also yeah. populism and charisma, those types of things. That's something that this movie deals with in an interesting way. And I love how it depicts that of like so many of these guys, like there's a few guys in here with really hardline principles. I, I love the moment where number 11, he has an accent, the guy with the ball game, it's like even it's tied. And the guy who wants to get to the ball game flips like he's mm -hmm. juror 11 is so incensed because he's like, I don't care what you decide. I just care that you don't just do it flippantly. Like, you know, you need to have reasons. And so there are some really principled guys in here, but like by and large, most of them, the majority seem motivated by their own little personal issue or like, hey, I just want to get out of here. It's hot. Or they're just convinced by somebody else or they like they want to go with the crowd instead of with like there's some of these guys you can kind of feel like they just flip at a certain point because like, oh, now the majority is going this way and I just want to be with the majority. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to make a scene. And that's the case at the beginning, too, where there's some guys where you could feel like maybe they have a few questions or some qualms, but they are not willing like Henry Fonda does to like take a stand yeah. at the beginning. That gets at, you know, not just like human nature in terms of how we make big decisions like this, but also the nature of just like arguments. It captures mm -hmm. really well where like there's that one moment where the angry guy, the last guy to flip, he's like, he said 20 seconds. And then the other guys are arguing like, no, it was 15. And he's like, how, you know, he doesn't know how long time is. And they yeah. go back and forth. And then he's not staying consistent with his argument. He's reasoning from like his presupposition or like the point that he's trying to reach, which is the guy's guilty. And then he backs himself mm -hmm. into a corner doing that. Yeah, classic uh, self-own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he knows it too. I love that little bit of acting there where you can see the exact moment of realization that <laughs> yes. he, he messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that it touches on that where it's like, argumentation mm. is not is very messy usually and people have it's often more about like i'm upset with this guy because he doesn't like me or they rub mm. me the wrong way and so i'm going to argue this point just because like you know i have reasons that maybe i don't even fully understand myself and we're inconsistent and we we say all these things and it's the rare person who's like you know i'm going to be calm and rational and you yeah. know say these points so i love how it, it captures that element of like just interpersonal dynamics and mm you know group dynamics and all of those things in that sense it does really show the amount of courage it takes to stand up to a or to take a, to assume a contrarian position like that when everyone else is convinced it's the other way around or the, the yeah like everyone says guilty and you're the one you're, you're you're not quite sure but you as you said i can imagine without henry taking the lead in that one there might have been others there's, there's a couple of jurors that are they get less screen time they're more underdeveloped but that's maybe because they might not have such strong feelings about the case they might think as you said like oh maybe this was a little iffy this is i'm not sure about this but then everyone seems so sure and you're just gonna go along because you know if, if everyone else is so sure then it's probably the right answer yeah. and yeah i guess not not to go back to the issue of whether this system works or not but i do like the way it at least then demonstrates the importance of being henry fonda in this case i think it's when it comes to depicting some kind of heroism within this yeah. situation i think they really did it they placed it correctly in the sense that it's not about arguing a specific stance like as, as we talked about henry isn't convinced this guy is not guilty he's just unsure that he's a hundred percent guilty which is a significant difference in this yeah. case i guess it also relates to or what i really like about it is the way this whole discussion is so divorced from the actual case we get one shot of the kid at the beginning the kid who's on trial and then at the end we also don't really learn like did he do it or not like right. we don't get any resolution about the case itself and i think that's that was a really interesting move because this you, you could so easily change this entire movie by either framing the kid more deliberately or even like literally just giving him some more screen time, giving showing a bit of his character and his life that yeah. might already give us as the audience a prejudice about who he is or what he may or may not have done. But especially I can imagine how different the movie would have been like if we knew that the kid was indeed 
guilty or not guilty. Right. That, that would have significantly changed the entire emphasis of the conflict. But I actually like the way that they didn't do that because then it really becomes about principle of reasonable doubt versus the just the one case of this particular kid. But yeah, what do you think about the way they presented or didn't present the actual defendant? I like the bottle nature of things as a kind of mm -hmm. corollary to that side note. I think this movie is kind of a masterclass in how to like do expositional writing in a way that feels completely natural because you you get all the details of the case like from the jurors themselves, but it never once feels like you have this moment where it's like, okay, now let's explain, hmm. you know, it just all a nat yep, naturally yep. like emerges within their discussion and argument, which I, I love. So if you if you need to know how to do exposition in a way that feels natural, watch this movie I, on repeat, I guess. I think that's an important piece of it because I, I think the movie does a good job of taking us on a ride too with like as the evidence is being put out there by the, the jurors originally, you are kind of like, well, I mean, it does seem like he probably did it based on what they're saying. Like, if that's the evidence, then he probably did. But you have to go through this process yourself of like, you can't really evaluate things. Like, there there are some things, like you said, like, you could put the pieces together yourself with like, you know, the L train and the noise and that kind of a thing. But I think, you know, mostly the revelations you probably won't be convinced in one way or another until the revelations happen. And that, but then like, there's a great line. I wish I'd written it down. It's about three quarters of the way through. I think the camera's kind of pushing in slowly towards Henry Fonda. Mm -hmm. Like most of the people have been, have kind of flipped at this point. And he says something about like, you know, we, we can't know. We pro we, we never really will. Like we, it's impossible for us to, to be certain. And I think the movie is very smartly like, really grappling with that idea of like not just did he do it but like how do you respond in a situation where like an objective truth is unknowable in total and mm -hmm. it's you know it's critiquing the certainty that a lot of these guys walk in with where they're just like oh yeah it was obvious you know from from this mm -hmm. from the go that he did it some of them have very blatant reasons like they're racist but for a lot of them, it was just like, oh, yeah, my, I, you know, I just had this gut feeling, you know, I made up my mind or whatever. And, you know, that's that. And so, like, I think that's, you know, I think that's an important point because there's a lot of people who I think do overestimate their ability to kind of objectively know something or verifiably, like, be certain that a certain thing happened. And that doesn't mean we, you know, we can never come to a reasonable conclusion about something where we, we convict somebody of something. But... It means that we have to be careful and thoughtful about, you know, those things that we that we can't know about. So, yeah, I think the de the decision to, like, leave all the context out really helps put us in the room with the jurors and inside that experience of like, you know, they mm -hmm. know more than we do. But like we especially don't know, you know, the details we never will within the context of this this story. Yeah, it got very David Humeish at that point, where <laughs> David Hume, the, the the famous philosopher who yeah. pretty much ruined knowledge for everyone, <laughs> 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 and and really argued against the idea that humans can know anything for with absolute certainty, which obviously throws a wrench into this whole system. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> because th this is another one of those things that you can easily see the other way around when there is obvious perpetrator to something like. Like I can imagine if there's a more, a crime where one would demand more justice, like let's say someone murdered a child or something, or some other case where everyone kind of feels like, oh, this is so obviously true and this is yeah. obviously an evil person who needs to be put away, but we don't have that certainty. So you can imagine then there, there there's so many ways for this movie to have been a completely different one, which I guess is interesting in itself. It feels like it tackles a lot of complicated subject issues in its short runtime, or at least it's relatively short runtime. But yeah, I agree. I, I also don't have the exact quote that you mentioned, but I do love the idea that I guess it doesn't emphasize the need for certainty, but at least the absence of false certainty, maybe. Right. I'm not sure what the best way to put it is, but yeah, I, I do like the idea that I think that's what the movie ends up arguing is that, okay, we have this 
system, we bear a responsibility within it to do our jobs properly. And the best way to go about it is for everyone to start with doing the, at least doing the work, start the discussion, not phone it in, not take any shortcuts to go see the ball game or whatever. And then to just really examine if someone is certain about it, where that certainty really comes from and what might yeah. be the underlying prejudices that might feed into that in a way that justified or doesn't serve the principle that the jury stands for in a meaningful way. I agree. I think if the movie has something meaningful and interesting to say, that's uh, part of what it is um, ultimately. And you mentioned earlier the framing of like Fonda's character as kind of a soft hero in this story. I think like, mm -hmm. like I said, like I saw this movie fairly young as a teen, I don't know what what my age would have been really, but I think like younger side of a teenager. It's funny, like rewatching this and looking back on this now, like I think I really did like as a young person, like see his character as like a like kind of a heroic role model. Like, I don't know. He was just like this was the kind of character like mm -hmm. that. I was like that, you know, whatever that guy's mm -hmm. doing like that's something that I want to have more of or want to be and that wasn't like something that I think I felt through that many films growing up but this this one for whatever reason was like juries have all always kind of fascinated me maybe because of this movie like not just like oh I want to go to a jury and pull a Henry Fonda and like you know <laughs> convince all the unreasonable people of what what is actually going on or something because I don't think that's really what what this mm -hmm. movie is trying to represent either but just like that ideal of like standing for a principle even like because that's the thing I think that's the that's a very important distinction here is he's not even standing for a specific belief mm -hmm. of like he's just standing for like mm -hmm. a certain way of approaching the situation of yeah. like you know, he's putting his foot down, not a conclusion, but for like a, this is how we should conduct ourselves. Yeah. I'm not sure if the movie explicitly goes into that, but to what extent he carries, what are, what are his prejudices? Or is he supposed to be the personification of absence of prejudice and more the embodiment of how it should be, in which case his personal preferences are left uh, on the outside? I think if there's any allusion to prejudice on his part, there's a moment at the very beginning where he, he goes into the bathroom, he's trying to dry his hands. And the one guy is like, I forget which other juror it is, but he's like, so, make some comment to the effect of like, was he abused by his father? And Fonda's character is kind of like, maybe. He doesn't really like confirm or deny. But I think there's an allusion there that maybe he was kind of in a similar situation to this Mm -hmm. the young man on trial of like, you know, abused by his father or had an aggressive father or something. And that might have been part of the spark. It leaves that, you know, he kind of, he's the one character we don't really get too much. Well, not the one character. There's a few more op opaque characters, but he's one character mm -hmm. we don't get like a, as clear a view into his, into maybe his motivation for doing this or why he, why he is yeah. that way. Unlike the guy who is wishy-washy just because he's an ad executive. <laughs> I noticed that this time I was like, I was like, I guess Sidney Lumet or whoever wrote this must not have liked ad people very much because there's this one guy <laughs> who's like, who's like, oh yeah, I'm an, I'm an ad executive. And he's just, <laughs> he's one of the limper <laughs> characters in the group. <laughs> I had one last question, sure. maybe quite insignificant, but what do you think, why does it, did it matter that it was the hardest day of the year? Well, I, that actually goes into something I wanted to touch on a little bit anyway, which mm. is just kind of like, you mentioned it at the beginning when we never really talked about it, which is like the creation of atmosphere here, where it's mm. like they're sweating you can see the sweat develop on them like as they go on their shirts and they're like cooling themselves off and creates a lot of movement in an otherwise static situation. Yeah. And yeah. at one point, like it starts raining and then they close the windows and then they figure out how to turn the fan on and all of those things like feel very insignificant. But I think it adds a lot of life to this very contained, otherwise static situation. It also just adds dramatic effect. Like you can feel the heat, mm -hmm. like they're almost in there boiling and like sweating metaphorically over this issue. But then like also you can see the sweat is like there's one scene towards the end where one of the last guys to turn, the guy with the glasses is finally convinced 
and like mm -hmm. a literal drop of sweat like develops on his forehead and like runs down his face and it's like you know it's a little on the nose of like oh he's sweating yeah. now because like you know he's realizing he he might be wrong or whatever but it's all then it's also motivated and it just adds to the like from the moment they get in there they want to get out of there you know it's not pleasant to be there mm -hmm. it's like the biggest thing is i think at the beginning it helps us feel like a little bit more sympathetic to all the guys who just like want to get it over with you know in the general atmosphere of like okay you know we all mm -hmm. know what's going on here let's just call it a day because yeah it's really hot and you want to get out of there turns the whole thing into this pressure cooker <laughs> yes yeah 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 but i love that i love that use of atmosphere and then the rain and then the sound of the rain plays a role in like the second half it, it just kind of there, there was something you said earlier you were talking about a section and you called it a scene and i was like that's a really interesting term to use because like normally we think of scenes in movies as being delineated by like locations like okay you move on to this new location and a scene happens and then it ends and mm -hmm. you go to another location and a scene happens but it's like this movie definitely has scenes and segments and like but it all is taking place not only in one room but like there's not these moments where like, oh, now it fades to the clock and like does a cross dissolve. So, you know, like time has passed. It's pretty much cut to be like real time. But yet mm -hmm. the way the camera is positioned breaks it up into chunks. There's certain like longer takes that help like divide sequences. They take little breaks from the discussion and there's little moments where they're like having asides or just messing around with paper on the table you know there's one moment where the guy's like trying to fold something up and then he like accidentally tears the paper and it's just like oh you know screw it but then also the changes in the environment around them like you know the rain kind of marks this this halfway point mm -hmm. and then the sound of the rain is in the second half which kind of moves in and out to like dramatic effect yeah th there's one little detail that's just occurring to me with the opening scene where the old guy is in the bathroom and it's taking much longer than everyone thinks like oh what you should be done by now but that right. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent that's foreshadowing their failure to estimate the old man's walk to the window or yeah uh, that's the testimony where the the we, we talked about it briefly where the old man is supposedly went from his bedroom to the door in 15 to 20 seconds and then they end up timing it and it ends up taking more than 40. So there might be a little bit of a connection there with the way they overestimate the speed yeah. of senior citizens, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. I forgotten when I rewatched it, I I didn't remember who the character was that was on the toilet at the beginning. At first I thought it was, was that Henry Fonda's character? But then he is revealed standing at the window somewhere. So that left me wondering like, who is this who other is person? And, and he kind of comes out unceremoniously and they didn't make a big deal of it that he was on the bathroom for supposedly too long. Like they don't go into, oh, what were you doing? They kind of just like, he's like, oh, I'm here now, let's begin. There was a moment where I felt like, what, why was this here? But yeah, yeah now, now that I'm thinking about it, it might be uh, an, another way, like the prejudice plays into it all. Yeah, yeah. I really like the character, the old guy. He's the first one to flip. I love his reasoning for flipping because he's kind of like, he's not really like, oh, now I'm convinced. It's interesting to me that like the reasoning he gives is not like, oh, now I'm convinced that he's not guilty. It's more like Fonda's character mm -hmm. was like, I'm not going to be the one vote that sends this kid to the electric chair. And then they have that second vote excluding Fonda. And the old guy is like, well, I'm just going to follow his example. And I'm not going to be the one vote who sends him to the chair. And it reminds me of there's a TED talk by this guy named Derek Severs, who is a really interesting business guy, ex-business guy, I guess. But he did... Mm -hmm this thing about leadership once and he shows this video of kind of these people like dancing in a field and it's like there's just like one guy just like dancing like crazy like on this hillside by this like at this music festival and there's no everybody else is like sitting on blankets gradually you see the entire tide turn and like by the end of it in this like six minute span of this video everybody on the hillside is like dancing like crazy and there's this moment where it's just this one guy like, you know, going wild and then somebody else gets up and starts dancing with him. And Derek Sivers has this quote line where he, he says, the first follower turns a lone idiot into a leader. Watching this reminded me of that, mm. where you have like one guy who stands out and then like 
really it's the first guy who's like, oh yeah, I'll I'll follow that. That turns Henry Fonda from like just some guy with like a specific axe to grind to like the leader of this movement that then sways all of these guys. So yeah, he's a fascinating character and there's a lot of little yeah. details like what you're talking about. I I didn't even think about that, but I think you're right mm -hmm. that 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 is a little bit of foreshadowing there. Yeah, I was just thinking about the scene where they have the the, the oversized map of the apartment. I just love the way that they have these little visual elements to yeah. to help clarify some things, and it seems a bit exaggerated in the way like, oh, here's a map, it's huge, <laughs> and, and, and the way they play it out. But uh, yeah, th yeah, there's obviously a lot of detail and attention to what that went into this, which yeah. uh, I guess is why it's earned its place as the uh, fifth best movie of all time on on IMDb at least. Yeah. And for a lot of people, the gateway to classic cinema. Yeah, I think it's a good one. It's very, it's very palatable. It's entertaining, but also interesting. There's layers there. And if for some reason you listen to this and you haven't seen it, which I guess we spoiled it, but I have so much fun watching it now again, even though like I already know everything that happens. Mm -hmm. So definitely worth rewatching, watching or rewatching if you haven't seen it in a while. It's a fun one. I like it. Yeah. Well, that's 12 Angry Men. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to check us out on our creator-owned streaming service, Nebula. There you can listen to all of our episodes a week early and without sponsorship reads or ad reads. You also get access to a monthly bonus episode. So far, we've covered movies like 1917, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, and Drive by Nicholas Winding Refn. And there will be more coming out as we go. Right now, the best way to get access to Nebula is by signing up for the Curiosity Stream plus nebula bundle it's less than 15 dollars for a whole year it's very affordable so check out that you can find the link in the descriptions below and we will talk to you next week